Great. Okay. Um, next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Peter Kim, who is um, our, our sort of head of liver transplant at, here in BC and VGH, and he's going to talk to us about live donor liver transplantation in BC. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. How do I, do I just advance this? this? Okay. Uh, ten, 10 minutes, right? 10 minutes. Yeah. No, 10 minutes, right? Is the, oh, 30 minutes. Okay. Like I said, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's really a privilege for me to be, take, uh, be, to be a part of this uh, amazing program. I'll talk a um, little bit about the uh, live donor liver transplant program in BC. Um, we're about to launch um, the program very soon with, the, with a lot of support from BC Transplant and everyone else at Vancouver Coastal. Um, so, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, as you know, I think um, you know Jag and all, all the other talks have uh, identified the the main problem in transplant. Um, uh, it's is that we have too many patients requiring um, who need liver transplants, but we just don't have a lot of donors. And uh, if we, because of the organ shortage, uh, uh, in uh, we don't have a, a dialysis machine for the liver to keep the patients alive. So if the liver transplant patient, uh, potential patients do not receive a liver transplant, then they die waiting for the transplant. So if we have organ shortage, that directly translates into weight least mortality, which is the percentage of the patients that die waiting for the liver and also that, that decreased survival. So the, the magic formula would be to increase the, um, the available um, organs uh, by addressing the organ shortage. And we've, we've done that uh, in the program uh, by uh, using extended donors. You know, so the, the, um, some, some of the older donors or um, donors with uh, some fat content in the, in the liver, uh, we've been quite aggressive in, in, in using those so that the patients can be transplanted. Uh, we've also revised the... Uh, um, the DCC uh, protocol, uh, just so that we can optimize protocols, uh, just so that we can increase the uh, usage of the um, uh, DCD donors uh, to address the organ shortage. And one of the uh, other strategies to address the organ shortage uh, in the setting of all this is to um, have a large donor program where someone who's, who's healthy can donate uh, part of their liver uh, uh, to the patients who need transplants. So this is a landmark study that we usually quote, you know, it's, um, so for those of you who don't know how the liver transplant listing works, uh, we usually uh, um, list patients according to the, to the MELD score. It's called the model for end-stage liver disease. Uh, we've recently been using sodium MELD, so that, and the MELD score usually includes uh, INR as well as bilirubin, which is supposed to uh, give you an idea as to functional ability of the liver. Uh, and then the creatinine, which is uh, related to the liver function. So higher the MEL score, uh, the higher the mor mortality on the wait list, which means that if you have a MEL score of greater than um, uh, 20, 22, uh, then at least your chances of dying from um, without a liver on the wait list is about 15% at three, three months. And if your MEL score is uh, around 40, uh, which is often uh, equivalent to someone who's in the ICU, uh, then your uh, risk of mortality waiting for the liver is about um, 85% in three months. Um, so uh, the way we list patients is according to MEL score. So higher the MEL score, higher they're on the wait list. And if, if there's an available liver, uh, then we try to assign the um, liver to the patients with the higher MEL score. So uh, you can imagine that there are some patients who have a lot of problems with their liver. So they have cirrhosis, portal hypertension, ascites, they have recurrent basal bleeds. But there are a subset of patients who have all those problems, but uh, with the low MELT score. So, so those patients, unfortunately, are sometimes uh, not offered liver transplant, mainly because they can't climb the list. Uh, so th this is a landmark study, Berg et al. They reviewed a, a, a number of um, the um, uh, patients who are on the wait list for liver transplant in the United States. You can see that the um, on the y-axis is the probability of death, and then um, on the eight x-axis uh, is the um, uh, is when they were evaluated for liver transplant and how many years it has been. So time zero is when they're evaluated for liver transplant, and if they continue to be on the wait list and are not offered a liver, 
then their mortality is high. So uh, this is for all comers. So at around four years after evaluation, if you don't receive a liver, your chance of death is about 50%. Um, and in most programs in the United States and Canada, they're offered a deceased donor liver transplant, which is um, DNC or DCC. Uh, you can see that um, uh, because there's still, some of them are waiting, some of them are offered a liver transplant. So even after uh, deceased on a liver transplant, their four-year survival rate is around 80%. So the probability of death is around 20%. <clears throat> but if you have a um, live on a liver transplant, uh, instead of waiting for, uh, for you to get sicker uh, and stay on the list, then your results are not as good as the patients who undergo a live on a liver transplant, but better than not having a transplant at all if the center case is less than 20. So if you get a live and liver transplant in an inexperienced center, then their results are better than not having a liver, but not as good as um, uh, having a, um, a disease donor liver transplant. But if you get a live and liver transplant at an experienced center, then there's no difference between uh, disease donor liver transplant, live and liver transplant. So basically um, what this study shows is that the, although your MEL score is low, uh, there's still survival benefit of live and liver transplant uh, over just waiting for the liver. Um, and uh, you preferably you want to do it at a, at, a, at, a, at a place with expertise. And then the center case, uh, what they define as expertise is greater than 20 um, live and liver transplant. This is our BC data. Uh, so as you know, um, thanks to all the work that the uh, BC transplant has done, I think our um, our um, the transplant volume has has increased, um, and then also because of you know of our population, I think our our, our patients are getting sicker, and that uh, more patients are activated on the uh, on the wait list. Uh, you can see that the, the blue blue graph are, are the number of patients who are activated on 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 our transplant list, and this doesn't capture the patients who are still waiting to be evaluated, and we have a huge backlog of patients uh, who are referred to the program. Uh, I thought kidney program doesn't have any problems, <laughs> but it sounds like they're having some issues with the preclinic as well. We do have a lot of patients who are, who, who are waiting uh, to be evaluated. Um, uh, but this 137 in 2023 were the patients who were activated, actually, who, who finished the evaluation, activated on the wait list. Uh, and then um, uh, five patients actually died on, on the wait list. And 14, 14 patients were deactivated, um, often uh, because they're, they're, they, were, they were deemed to be too sick. Uh, we, we do have a couple of patients who come in and they are initially listed, uh, for example, in the case of acute liver failure, and then uh, they improve uh, and then they recover fully, so they're deactivated. However, most of these patients who are deactivated are the ones who were found to be too sick or, or uh, we found other issues uh, that would preclude them from undergoing liver transplant. Um, and then these are uh, the, this is a number that, uh, that explains the number of uh, liver transplants that were performed. So you can see that there's been a steady increase over the last uh, 13 uh, years. Uh, I think that there was a, um, a point at which um, uh, around 2014 to 2016, you know, we, we've seen a, uh, quite a bit of an increase. Um, I think, um, and then we were, we had a live liver transplant program up until about 2015. Uh, and because of the uh, increase in the disease donor transplant program, and then also for a number of reasons, um, the, the program uh, stopped. And then now we're, we're here to uh, uh, restart uh, with, uh, with the revamp. But you, you can see that if you, um, our waitlist mortality is relatively low, um, you know, uh, probably due to the fact that we've had an increase in the uh, DNC and the CC donors, uh, just so that we can transplant those patients who are towards the top of the list who have a higher risk of mortality. We are getting them done, but we're certainly not being able to offer patients who have low melts and who sit on their list for years and years. Just to tell you what our volume was, this is before my time, obviously a lot of the, um, this amazing work was done by the uh, previous group, uh, including Dr. Scudamore, Chang and Butchkovsky, who, uh, who, who essentially carried the program. So it, uh, as a program, I think we've done over 50. Uh, you can see that the 2010-2012 uh, were the busiest years with about seven. I think if you ask anybody in, the, in our community now, um, 
just to maintain the skills, the volume, and also the outcomes. Uh, you know, people usually recommend doing about a, one a month at least of the deceased donor liver transplant in the setting of a well-established uh, liver transplant program. So that's so where our, our aim is to around 12 to 15 uh, per year eventually. Uh, so in general, the candidacy for liver donor liver transplant uh, is that if you have complications of like liver disease, so cirrhosis, poor hypertension, which means some people have ascites, um, some people have pruritus, uh, or if you have a, um, an underlying condition such as primary sclerosing cholangitis, uh, which uh, causes multiple biliary strictures, sometimes these patients have biliary tubes or uh, multiple stents. And those patients don't always go into liver failure, but they have tubes hanging out and, and, and they have recurrent infections, and that's certainly an indication for liver and liver transplant. But basically, if you have all patients with established cirrhosis or without, uh, so in the cases of primary schoolers and cholangitis with low melt and severely diminished quality of life. Uh, this is our living donor liver transplant team. I think, um, you know, I think this is just some people. We have coordinators, which would be, which would be the lifeline uh, of our program, hepatologist, Dr. Marquez, as well as um, uh, the uh, rest of the hepatology team. We also have social worker. Uh, we also have independent internal medicine, Dr. J. Pai, who's agreed to be the internal uh, medicine person who can assess the donors for their overall um, uh, medical issues. We have uh, pretty engaged um, radiologists because we need sophisticated imaging, uh, including hepatic uh, volumetry, as well as anesthesia OR. Uh, we've been working for months and months trying, just trying to get the program up to ground. I think. Um, Oh, thank you. Someone reformatted this for me. I think uh, Eric Lund's been really, really supportive um, uh, from BC Transplant, I think. Um, and also the Sarah Holly from BCH and Sarah, Sharon Gradden. I don't know if Sharon and Sarah are here, uh, but uh, they've been really, really helping us to um, uh, get the program off the ground. Uh, I think we've met hours and hours and they've been really trying to um, keep us on, on track. So I think... Um, so our, our target is about five, five in the first, depending on, you know, I think, I apologize, I don't know what happened to the formatting, but so we're about to um, start um, evaluating donors in the, in the next month or so. Uh, and then we're hoping that we can do five in the first year. And then once we get the machine going, we're hoping to do about 12. If we can do 12 to 15 a year, I think that would be amazing. Then I think that we can really offer patients who are um, in the lower part of the wait list who, you know, who, you know, who rarely get offers and uh, who are still suffering. I think we can offer those patients um, liver transplants. Uh, and then um, what we do want to do is, uh, uh, in the beginning, have really good results. So we want to focus on the patients who are quote unquote straightforward, uh, just so that we can get the program off the ground, have good results uh, with low complication rates and higher survival, just so that we can um, have you know, buy in you know, from the team per se. Uh, but, but all in all, I think uh, we're pretty excited uh, to be able to offer this to our patients. And I think um, uh, we can, there are a subset of patients who, uh, who we don't list uh, nowadays because the initial dogma in, in uh, liver transplant has been that if your MEL score is 15 or less and you're otherwise stable, uh, patients are usually not offered listing, mainly because uh, the rationale is that the, um, the thought is that if you do, those patients are quote unquote not sick enough, so the listing them doesn't really justify um, them undergoing the risk of liver transplantation. But nowadays, I think our liver transplants are pretty low risk anyway, uh, with with low complication rates. So I think we can. There are certainly um, a lot of those patients who we haven't listed before can certainly be um, considered for live donor or uh, liver transplant. So I think um, I'll stop right there. I'm sure there are some questions. And I'd be happy to answer any. So. Thanks, Peter. I don't know if there's any questions in the room, but um, there was, was one question uh, with, uh, in regards to the. Um, sir. Oh, okay. Kim, go ahead. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the um, uh, safety for the donor uh, to donate. And like I know with kidney, it's generally fairly safe, and we 
can do it anonymously and that kind of stuff. What's sort of the criteria we're looking at for the donors? Yeah, so the, um, I mean, I didn't put it there, but the, you're absolutely right. I think the, the donors are healthy people who don't need surgery, but they're out of the goodness of their hearts. They want to donate. So the donor safety is, uh, is, um, is, is of paramount importance. Uh, so we do have a, a, a number of criteria in terms of making the assessment uh, quite uh, robust so that we select the donors who will have low risk of complications after. Uh, we also do ha put in a number of safety checks post-operative in the hospital and also when they go home so that the donor donors can contact um, the surgeon so that we can address things uh, quickly. Uh, the donor death rate uh, after right lobe is around one in 500, uh, and then left lobe is around one in 1,000, right? So I think all in all, yes, we, I do agree completely, but we do have a, quite a comprehensive um, criteria as well as the mechanism to make sure that the donors do well after. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, thanks. I was, is that, what is the criteria? Do we know, or we just haven't gotten to that yet? Or? No, so, so in general, the, um, the donors age, there's age criteria, usually 55 or less, right? Um, some, some centers have a BMI criteria, mainly because um, they think that it does uh, um, uh, correlate with some hepatic steatosis, right? Uh, and then um, there are the general medical criteria, so they, you know, they can't have any significant medical comorbidities. Uh, there's also psychi you know, psychology, uh, uh, psychosocial, psychosocial criteria, um, you know, because uh, the rare, rare risk of uh, you know, suicides and such after donation. Uh, so th that's some of them. Uh, and then after that, there's anatomic criteria based on the CT and MRI findings. Uh, and then that's about it, I guess. So. Thanks, Peter. Um, there's questions here, a few people are wondering about, is there any different in recipient eligibility requirements, alcohol use, et cetera, and brackets for a liver from a living donor versus deceased, or yeah. is it the same? So I think, so the, the usual, the general um, answer that we give is that, no, we don't actually like lower the, the criteria that you need to meet to be a deceased donor liver transplant candidate. Uh, so that uh, whether it's alcohol, just because you know you bring a donor, it doesn't mean that we can lower, we can change the criteria that you know someone can. So that someone has to be that person has to be a, a candidate from a liver transplant perspective. Period for deceased donor when it comes to medical and psychosocial perspective. Does that make sense? Okay. Thank you. Um, it, 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 there's a question here: Is living donation a viable treatment option for retransplantation? Yeah, no. So they, there are some centers in the in, in Asia who do a lot. Um, I don't know of any centers in the United States who who do them. Maybe Pittsburgh might do one or two, but but in general, retransplant is not a. Uh, we it, it'd, be, it'd be extremely difficult for us to do live donor transplant. Um, there's a, a few people were asking again. I think you talked a bit about this as to why their program was stopped five to ten years ago and, yeah. and starting. Yeah, I don't again. know. I think there are probably multiple reasons. I would imagine. I think uh, the um, there's there was a there was an increase in the uh, disease donor uh, activity. I think that probably kind of took over the the live donor. Uh, I would imagine there's been some change in the team members, um, and also um, you know I, I wasn't here when that happened, but. Uh, I would imagine it's usually due to multiple reasons. And, and just sort of for me, looking at it, um, my, the impression I'm getting is it, it, the need for deceased donors is, is as strong as ever, and that, that, that this is going to be targeting more people that would be lower down on the list that, that, to provide them with the option that, that, that probably would have a much harder time actually getting a transplant. Absolutely. Is that correct? Yes. You know, so you're, you've actually summarized it. Uh, act, you know, perfectly. So there are the, so if you look at the list, like a like ladder, I guess, and then, you know, patients who are, who are lower down, you know, um, they never get a liver offer, right? And then patients who are higher, uh, they get the liver offer. And then, you know, um, and then when the next liver comes along, there's another person who's sicker. Uh, and then, you know, those patients who are lower on the list, those patients, as, as I, as I've shown in the data, that they benefit from liver transplant as well. It's better for them to receive a live donor rather than just keep waiting. So. Thank you. Um, okay, a question here. What do studies show as uh, the long-term prognosis of living liver donors? Yeah, so in experienced centers for the graft and patient survival, 
The living donor transplant is equivalent to um, a deceased donor liver transplant. Um, living donor liver transplants uh, do have a higher rate of uh, bile duct complications. So the bile duct complications meaning whenever it's the last last structure that we connect after liver transplant and it's the tube that drains the liver. Um, the in uh, a deceased donor liver transplant, the complication rate is about ten to fifteen percent. It's either leak or stricture, and in a, a live donor, it can be up to about thirty percent. And that can usually be addressed with a procedure or, or an operation. But if you look at the um, the um, experience centers, the long-term survival for graft and patient survival is the same as disease owner. Thank you. Um, so it's an interesting question. If we can do living liver donation, does that mean we can have two recipients from one deceased donor? I don't know. I guess the idea that you're not using all of the liver of a living, uh, would you be able to split? Um, yeah. A, a so the uh, so good question. So you can have a so the there's a live donor. So and then the splitting a, a deceased donor into two. That's called the insights of split for two adults. Or uh, what's what is often done is a um, you take the uh, what we call the smaller liver, left left lateral segment for, for a for a baby, uh, and then the uh, the other like two thirds of the liver will go to an adult. That's commonly done, uh, but splitting the liver uh, it, right right in the half and two of them going to um, to adults is doable, uh, but it's not commonly done. It just has to do with uh, the liver has to be big enough to to um, to 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 address um, two uh, two adults. So the one strategy you can do is a uh, uh, pick a, uh, um, a really small uh, recipient. Uh, often uh, it's small um, female uh, re re recipient, and they sometimes get passed a lot on the list because uh, uh, because you know the liver is often found to be too big. Currently, we just cut the liver down and don't use that part that we that we uh, cut down. Uh, but yes, if you have too small. Uh, recipients, you can cut down the liver in half and, and give it to both. So. Uh, thank you. Um, do donors have any say, or will they have any say as, in who they could donate to? In other words, someone may not want to donate to an alcoholic induced liver disease. I mean, that's yeah. getting a little but No, so good question. So, uh, so the, there is a, um, most of the donors actually donate to someone they know. So it's, you should, so it's, it's a directed live donation. Uh, there is a um, um, a concept called the anonymous uh, donation. So, for example, I think in tr in Toronto, they would they would come in, usually donate to someone they don't know. They would just come forward and say, "I want to donate my liver to somebody." Often, the um, the that goes to a, to a uh, a pediatric uh, recipient. But yes, if you're a live donor, often um, it's in the setting of someone that they know, and then it's it's a direct donation. And somewhat related to that is there's a question of uh, could there be a paired exchange for blood type mismatches, I guess, following? Oh, yeah. So it's, done, it's been done. I think the first place to do it was in, in, um, in, in Turkey, I think. Uh, and I want to say that they did it at USC. Uh, uh, yeah, but it's, it's certainly possible. So, for example, if you have a um, uh, potential donor but not a match for you, and then same situation for another uh, recipient, then you, you, you could do that. Oh, thanks, Peter. Um, there are a few people who are wondering about um, specifically how you would potentially supporting indigenous populations with living donation. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, hopefully there, there will be uh, indigenous patients who need liver transplants, and we would be happy to entertain. I don't think we have a specific program to address that, but what we can say is we treat everyone the same and and with the respect and and um, care that we do so. Um, that's great. The, the last question here was just asking. Oh, they keep adding new ones. Um, what? Uh, <laughs> okay. Will Will BC follow Toronto and allow anonymous, non-directed donation? Yeah, I think so. I think we, you know, we wanted to. So I think there is a. Sorry. Excuse me. <laughs> Uh, so I think what we would like to uh, do everything, I think, but I think whenever we are restarting the program, I think we wanted to just focus on the outcomes and not introduce anything that would complicate things, I think, more. But yes, definitely we would like to um, do that. I think Toronto has been kind of our, quote unquote, uh, colleagues and a, a mentor program because a lot, a lot of us trained in Toronto. Uh, yeah, and we've 
Yes, yeah, certainly would like to present to that in the uh, in the future. So. That might be the end as I turn this off. Um, um, and then the last was just why don't we split livers from deceased donors? I guess that's something that's more common. I yeah, so it's, it goes to peds, and then the uh, like third of the liver will go to the baby. Uh, so, but we don't. So it would usually. Uh, be happen in the, in the program where there's a pediatric program like Edmonton or Toronto. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, I was, we're literally looking forward to hearing you come back in, in a couple of years. So. Thanks, Peter. That's great. Great. Yeah. And uh, it's there's time for a break, and we'll start back in about 15 minutes, a quarter after. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>